Welcome to the Linguava Podcast, The Invisible Profession, where we give you tools, tips, and resources in medical interpretation and translation that help bring to life our industry and ultimately help improve health outcomes for the limited English proficient communities. Welcome everyone to episode number seven with the Invisible Profession podcast with Linguava. Super excited to have Jennifer Alvarez from Providence Health Systems joining us today, who comes with over 25 years of experience in the ASL interpretation sector, as well as running a language service department for one of the largest health systems in all of Oregon. Really excited to talk about medical interpretation from the hospital perspective and how we can ultimately raise the bar for all entities involved. So Jennifer, so excited to have you on the show. Thank you for being with us today. Hi, David. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. I appreciate you having me. I'm excited too. Tell us a little bit about your story and how you got started in language services. Well, you know, I actually, so it's, it's sort of interesting. I, I started out um, working in the cruise industry uh, many, many moons ago, I think back in 94, and I spent about 22 years uh, working for a cruise line or the cruise industry in general. And uh, my role when I was with a, with a specific cruise line, uh, my role involved ADA. It, was, it wasn't necessarily language services. It was all things related to the ADA. So we were talking about, uh, we were writing policies and procedures and training shipboard staff and training mm-hmm. reservation staff on, on how to, uh, everything from booking to sailing with uh, cruise passengers with a variety of disabilities. Um, and so we started there, and and one of the one of the pieces in the cruise industry that um, didn't get a lot of traction until recent years were were interpreter services provisions for passengers who were deaf, deaf blind, hard of hearing. Um, back back in those days, cruise lines were not providing interpreters for cruise passengers with disabilities, hmm. and so um, that that became a I don't know, that kind of became a a pain point for me um, in thinking like, you know, we do all of these really wonderful things as a cruise, as an industry, we do all these really wonderful things for people Mm -hmm. with disabilities, but all of a sudden someone who's deaf comes to us and says, you know, I need a sign language interpreter because I'm deaf and how am I going to hear any of the, you know, emergency drills or any of the announcements? How am I going to hear any of those things? Um, Cruise lines at the time just said, sorry, bring your own interpreter. And I thought, oh, it just doesn't make any sense. So it became a real, it became a real passion project for me. And then when I transitioned to working with multiple cruise lines, um, that was one of the, that was what I focused on. In addition to talking about ADA compliance, but my focus was really about um, how, how cruise lines could effectively, how cruise lines could uh, provide effective communication for for their deaf and hard of hearing and deaf blind passengers. And, and then I got into, you know, really uh, working with the deaf community and working with the sign language interpreting community for many, many years to develop policies and procedures and a program uh, that cruise lines could um, rely on for uh, requesting interpreter services. And so we kind of, it was twofold. Um, yes, we were an inf- a source of information. I was a source of information, but also turned into an agency, I guess, for lack of a better, we didn't mm. structure it like an agency, but mm-hmm. we were providing interpreters for cruise lines around the world. And it got to, wow. I think we were providing interpreters by the time I got out of the industry in 2016, we were probably providing interpreters for, oh, over a thousand sailing cruise departures a year. And now yeah. they understand. Now, mm-hmm. now the industry is really, uh, you know, they're doing a, a bang up job up until COVID, of course, but they're doing a yeah. bang up job at, at accommodating. So that's, that's excellent. Well, it's so cool that you were, you were a part of that, that pioneering and really able to, op- able to open, open people's eyes to a huge, uh, huge blind spot there that people had in regards to providing the essential services, uh, whether it's for, for deaf, hard of hearing, blind uh, individuals. So for you making that transition over to, to Providence and, uh, and overseeing the, the language services department, what was that transition like for, for you? And how did you see that the difference where on the cruise ships where there was, you know, there's a lot more ignorance initially, how did you see coming into the healthcare system 
the level of awareness as it pertains to the ADA laws and um, interpretation laws. Yeah. So, uh, so I saw a lot of parallels. First of all, I, 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 I came into Providence mm-hmm. and I did not have a background in the spoken language, uh, on the spoken language side of, of interpreter services and, and the provision of those services. And, and I did not have a healthcare background. But what I did see is I, I did see a lot of parallels in that attitude of why, why would we call for an in-person interpreter? This, the patient's sister is right here to interpret. Mm-hmm. Or, uh, you know, we have uh, one of our MAs, uh, they speak Spanish. So we'll just, you know, we'll rely on one of our, our medical assistants or one of our nurses to come in or, or any group of mm-hmm. any, you know, put, put any kind of title or any kind of group of, of individuals on there that are, are bilingual thinking that that's sufficient. So I yeah. saw a lot of, similarities in that level of um, that, that lack of awareness, if you will, uh, of, of how, how it's different, <laughs> just how it's different and, and mm-hmm. there needed to be education first and foremost. And that's the foundation of, of, for Providence, Oregon, that was the foundation of our language access program is it had to start with education. Um, you yeah. have, you know, caregivers have to, they have to call for an interpreter or they have to get a video interpreter. They have to get an, a, a telephonic interpreter. We aren't using employees. We aren't using care, other caregivers to do this. And yeah. so the education, that foundation, so we had to start with, you know, policies. It, it was when I came to Providence, um, I actually thought uh, that coming into a healthcare system that where the ADA is that, you know, there are clear, there are clear guidelines regarding the Americans with Disabilities Act in the healthcare uh, in the healthcare industry where they don't exist in the cruise industry. So when I came into Providence, I actually um, came in thinking, Oh, this will be, mm-hmm. this will be easy. Cause there's all kinds of laws right. around this and, and come to find out. Um, I think healthcare in general uh, is, is, was a little behind the times mm. uh, in 2016, I think healthcare. And so at Providence, when I started, what we really did is I just kind of broke everything down and said, we have to start from scratch here. You yeah. know, we have to, we have to blow up all these policies and just kind of, you know, get rid of all the way we used to think, of, you know, the way that we thought we had to do things or the way we used to do things. We really have to start um, educating from the ground up again, or the top down, educating from the top down as well. Yeah. And that also included not just, uh, not just ADA related um, interpreter services, um, ADA related interpreter services for, for patients with disabilities, but also the spoken language piece. And that has been, um, that's been really rewarding work. And I think Providence, Oregon's mm-hmm. come a long way. Another question for you, Jennifer, is how today do the majority of providers, kind of a gener- generalized question, view interpretation services? Um, you know, again, it's evolved. I think that there are a number of providers now that um, they get it. They understand. Uh, we have a number of providers who have have said um, for for you know a number of years, like this isn't working with a family member. Or, this isn't this yes. isn't working. Writing notes back and forth, you know, and and they're relieved. Um, they're relieved to have the services, um, the interpreter services in a structured manner and having phone numbers uh, of vendors that they can contact and reliable resources and technology that they can rely on. Uh, so I think that has evolved a lot in the last, especially within Providence. I yeah. think that's evolved a lot in the last four years. And most of our, most of those providers are uh, welcome interpreter services with open arms and, and are happy to engage the appropriate services. But you still see, whether it be Providence or any other healthcare system, this isn't unique yeah. to Providence, you still see some individuals that are hold out, uh, that hold out on, on and have, still have reservations about interpreter services. And sometimes it has to do with, um, you know, it, it, the convenience factor, right? Um, right? Calling and getting someone scheduled or if, if, if maybe uh, an interpreter wasn't scheduled um, in advance, you know, a provider gets in with a patient and they don't have an interpreter. And so they feel flustered. Um, Our providers and caregivers in healthcare are in a situation where they're having to do more work with less time and waiting for a service, waiting for an interpreter service, if it hasn't been planned appropriately um, 
waiting for an interpreter service to engage an interpreter service costs, costs time. Time is money. Yep. So that's frustrating. I also think that there are still a lot of reservations about um, the cost of interpreter services and especially the cost associated with providing American Sign Language interpreters um, because interpreter services yeah. It costs money and you it get very, you, you, you mm-hmm. get very little, if any return on that. There's no, it, it is, it's a, it's a, it's a um, mandated expense. It's a mm-hmm. unfunded, it's an unfunded mandate, if you will. And your return on this investment doesn't really hit your pockets until you realize it's actually, it's saving you money, but it isn't making you money. And right now everybody needs to make money, right? Healthcare mm-hmm. needs to make money. Um, and uh, so interpreter services are an, an, an expense. And for some groups, uh, it's a it's a huge expense, small, uh, small pr- private, like private physicians offices, for yep. example, having to pay for American Sign Language interpreters. That's a big expense. Um, yep. Hospitals, hospitals having to pay that have a, a, a diverse patient population, uh, diverse non-English speaking patient population. Interpreter services is, uh, it's an expensive step. It's an yeah. expensive step, but it's necessary. So there are still some reservations around that piece. And, and not, not everyone, like as you mentioned, everyone is maybe viewing it that way or seeing it that way or just looking at the cost going, how can I, how can I possibly entertain this can't I just grab you know my bilingual staff I mean hey they they speak Spanish or or Russian or they do know um, ASL or or asking a family member to come in so what would you say to to those providers who are maybe cutting cutting those corners are thinking like isn't isn't this good enough uh you know I go back to kind of that old (laughs) the old approach of what if that was your mother Mm. Would is what is good enough? Would you accept good enough for your mother or your mm-hmm. brother or your sister or your child? Would you accept good enough? I wouldn't. If my parents spoke Russian and needed an interpreter, I wouldn't be okay with a, a random person that I don't know anything about mm-hmm. that doesn't have training in interpretation. I I don't. They might. They may. Maybe they do speak Russian. How would I know? I don't, if I don't speak Russian, I wouldn't know the difference. Am I, am I willing to accept just good enough for my family member? And the answer to that is no. And I think that most people are going to say the same thing. Yeah. No, good enough. Good enough. Isn't um, good enough. Doesn't suit me and it doesn't mm-hmm. suit my family. It doesn't suit my loved ones. And I, I, I tell this, you know, I, I say this a lot of time, you know, there's a difference between going to Mexico and having, um, spring break, <laughs> spring break level Spanish skills, you know, being able to interpret the medical terminology for uh, an oncology or chemotherapy appointment an extensive chemotherapy appointment, talk about treatments and, and aftercare and, and all of those things. You certainly want to make sure that the people that are doing the interpreting, the individuals that are doing the interpreting uh, have the appropriate language skills mm-hmm. to be able to convey that message. And then also, you know, we, we talk a lot about, um, uh, having interpreters who, uh, with no conflict of interest and in making sure that there aren't yes. other, other interests involved in that communication. Um, sometimes we even talk about, you know, liability, you yeah. know, for providers, it's, it's for providers, thing. especially yeah. there's a huge liability to settle for good enough. Mm-hmm. Um, because you never really know what you're getting from someone who isn't an actual interpreter. Right. And if there are other, other factors playing into consideration. So I, I, we, I, you know, we talk about that a lot here at Providence um, and our providers are, are really wonderful, um, especially when we kind of share some of those scenarios. Yeah. And then from a, like you said, you can look at, look just at the, at the price and go, gosh, that's, it seem, seems like a lot and getting, getting past that, looking at what's the overall, what is this going to overall cost me if, if I do cut a corner and, and bring a family member and there is a misinterpretation, the liability there. And we have, we all know about you know, so many lawsuits that have happened due to the misinterpretation oh, yeah. where there was not a professionally trained interpreter um, present. And so yeah. and ultimately the, the health outcomes, which is, which is the goal of, of improving health outcomes and patient experiences. And so how is that going to happen if we are 
cutting the corner and not providing professionally trained interpretation. So yeah, yeah. Pivoting slightly to a really important topic that, that you know, you, you and I talk about a lot and it's, um, it's, it's covered a lot in different um, interpretation conferences and it's the whole concept of being part of the medical team. You have mm. the, in, in your case, you know, Providence providers, they are on their medical team. They have different, different physicians and physicians assistants and um, that are on, on this, this team. And then now you're bringing in a medical interpreter. So someone yeah. from a language service provider that's, that's coming in for the day, for the, the one, two, three, four, five hours. Um, and then there would be, would, would be leaving. So they're not a, they're not a hospital employee, but mm-hmm. they are coming in to serve a vital, vital function and play a vital role. Um, so my question for you is how, how important is it that we are viewing interpreters as part of the medical team? I mean, <clears throat> I've always thought that this was a really interesting, um, I always thought this was really interesting in, in healthcare specifically. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, 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 I struggled to understand how any, any healthcare team, any, any, any medical team, nurses and, and providers alike, how, how they how they felt like they could treat patients that they couldn't communicate with mm-hmm. the way I see it. And I'm, I am not a clinician. I do not have a background in healthcare, but what I can tell you is if you can't communicate with your patient, you can't ask questions. You can't, you don't understand their answers. You don't, you can't dig deeper into, um, into you know something that may seem small uh, that that has evolved a healthcare condition maybe a, a medical condition that has evolved and, and and has progressively gotten worse if you can't as a as a as a clinician if you can't ask the right questions because that's what healthcare that's mm-hmm. what clinicians are trained to do they're trained to ask a series of questions to yeah. get to the core root of whatever mm-hmm. is happening with a patient right and so if you can't have that dialogue, if you can't have that exchange in a meaningful way and feel confident that the yeah. patient, A, understands the questions that you're asking, but also knows how to answer those questions. So w- when, we would, when we would see providers kind of not, um, uh, when we would see providers feeling like they didn't have to include an interpreter, it's like, no, you know, this is, this is at the mm-hmm. core of how you're going to treat this patient. If you don't yeah. have this interpreter in there, you really aren't going to be able to get to the bottom of whatever's happening. And so, so at Providence, uh, we talk a lot about embracing interpreters as a part of the care team, um, making sure that interpreters are allowed into exam rooms and making sure that they are treated. Um, you, you wouldn't have a, you wouldn't let a, a, a nurse, um, uh, escort a patient out to have a cigarette, for example, you, 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 mm-hmm. you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have caregivers and clinicians doing certain things with patients. You just like, you don't have them have interpreters accommodating those, right. those types of requests. Right. And so you, you have a, a, an interpreter there facilitating that com- communication, serving as that, that language, that conduit for language mm-hmm. and understanding um, and, and embracing them as part of that care team and treating them accordingly. Um, and that's, that's something that we, we've really worked on, especially in the last two to yeah. three years. Yeah, no, and that's, and it's, it's, it's so true. Cause it's a, it's a unique, unique situation when you're, when you're bringing someone else in, you know, from, from the outside and then really understanding, okay, now what is, what is this, this person's main, main role going to be as the, mm-hmm. as the interpreter? Are they here also? as a, as an advocate, are they here also, you know, as representing the family? I mean, there's just lots of, lots of uh, sometimes misunderstandings I think that happen with what the interpreter's role is and, and isn't. And I know that, that you, you and at Providence have been, been doing a really great job of training on the, the, the role of the interpreter. Well, and I think too that, oh, sorry, not to cut you off. I was just going to say it, it also to make sure that that providers and, and clinicians alike understand that, you know, we're not bringing in somebody to be an interpreter who's 
just because they speak Spanish doesn't mm-hmm. mean that they're an interpreter. Just because they speak Russian doesn't mean that they're an interpreter. These are individuals who have specifically been trained um, to n- number one, who've been trained in the role of an interpreter and what that is. It's um, uh, we talk a lot about uh, we talk a lot about this um, in uh, when we when we wrote when Providence wrote our um, policy around bilingual caregivers. There's a difference between speaking one on one to an individual in Spanish, Russian, Vietnamese versus yeah. interpreting between an English speaking individual mm-hmm. and a non English speaking individual. That that function, the brain function of being an interpreter requires specific and special training. Right. So that's the first thing, making sure that they understand that this isn't just someone who can speak the language. This is someone who's been trained in that processing, uh, that the, the processing that happens in the brain between English and another language. Mm-hmm. That's the first thing. The second thing is they've been trained on um, HIPAA and ethics and um, code of conduct. Uh, they have pursued additional education and certifications. Um, and then finally, they have also pursued uh, the additional knowledge that it requires to be an interpreter in the medical field, right? right. This isn't, it's, it, it, again, going back to American Sign Language, you have interpreters who specialize in legal, you have interpreters who right. specialize in medical, you have interpreters who specialize in theater, right? Yeah. Or education. Academics, There's, yeah. yeah, exactly. In academics. And, and so uh, it's important for caregivers to understand that, you know, at least for Providence, one of the reasons that, that we partner with the vendors that we do is because we know that the interpreters that are coming from our vendors are, are, are medical centered interpreters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. And that's, and that's su- such an important component as we're talking about interpreters being part of the medical team, right? Cause it's really, it's gotta, it's gotta make sense on, on both sides, so to speak. So for the, for the provider training component, we're helping educate providers understanding why it's important that interpreters are, are, are viewed as part of the medical team. And then on the interpreter side, of course, we want to be viewed as, as part of the medical team as an important vital role. And in order to do that, similar to what you're, you're talking about, is we also have to make sure that we are showing up with the right qualifications and certifications yes. and, and HIPAA exactly. certifications, um, background checks and vaccinations and requirements. Can you can you talk a little bit about what those what those requirements look like? And I know for a lot of a lot of hospitals, Providence does a great job of this. And there might be some hospitals that are that are wrestling with what should we be doing as a as a yeah. hospital. Um, what, so talking about about compliance, how 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 should how should hospitals be be thinking about that when they're thinking about what LSP they're going to work with, which is language service provider. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, again, we just, you know, we, we take it clear back to when you get hired on at a company, any company, it doesn't matter. There are, there are things as an employee of a company that you have to do. You have Mm -hmm. to um, uh, agree to a code of conduct policy. You have to adhere to a dress code. Uh, You may be, you may be subject to um, a drug screening, a pre-employment drug screening. Um, there's a, there's a, there's a, 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 there's a conduct that is expected of employees and that will look different for there's, that'll look different for different businesses and different industries. Right. Right. So for me, um, I know what it looks like to be an employee of a cruise line. I know what it looks like to be an employee of a healthcare system. So my and I and I and I also know what the requirements are for a healthcare system uh, to be in compliant with certain regulations, whether it be Joint Commission, um, uh, the state or federal government requirements. Uh, various, there's all kinds of laws in healthcare. Yeah. I mean, it, it it still blows my mind how many how many how highly regulated uh, healthcare. Not that I didn't expect it, but it's just there's a lot in healthcare, and so for me. If the rules are that uh, interpreters have to be certified or qualified, and when I say rules, it could be, again, I'll just use Joint Commission as an example. If the interpreters have to be certified or qualified, if they have to have background checks on file, if they have to have pre-employment drug screenings on file, whatever the case may be, it is that simple. Interpreters 
have to be held to the same type of standard that an employee of a healthcare system. If they want to be embraced, they want to show up mm -hmm. at a clinic or at a hospital and they want to be embraced by clinicians as a part of the healthcare team, they need to act like a part of the healthcare team. And I've heard some interpreters say, well, I'm not an employee of Providence. That's okay. You're not an employee of Providence. You're not mm -hmm. an employee of Legacy or Kaiser or whatever. If you're not an employee, that's fine. But if you choose to work, mm -hmm. if you choose to work in healthcare, it is your responsibility to rise to the occasion as an interpreter. And it is the responsibility of a healthcare system to hold those interpreters accountable. Yeah. So it's important to, it's important to, and, it, and if I want quality interpreters, and David, you, <laughs> you, you can probably attest to this. Uh, when I started at Providence, you know, I, I'm a rule person, I'm an enforcer. Mm -hmm. And even if that means that I am going to um, have a, a, a shortage of Spanish speaking interpreters, I can't have interpreters in my hospitals that can't pass a drug test or can't pass a background check. Um, we have to, we have to hold right. vendors accountable for that, mm -hmm. for that standard. So, yeah. The line, and the line has to be drawn. The standard has to be set. The line, that's exactly right. The line has to be drawn. The standard has to be set. And then what happens is what you see is other healthcare systems. Um, I got this a lot. Well, how do you, I mean, we don't, you know, some healthcare systems say, well, we don't require that or, or we don't, we don't check on that. Well, I mean, that's on you, I guess. But at the same time, if Joint Commission comes into one of my hospitals and wants to look at my uh, and wants to look at my my contract with one of my interpreter services vendors, and right. they want to pull the file, if they want to pull files on ten of ten interpreters, random interpreters, it's my responsibility as the language access manager for for the state. Uh, it's my responsibility to make sure that those interpreter files are in order. And with, since I don't have direct control over that, it's my responsibility to hold my vendor accountable to those mm -hmm. files and to those checks and balances. And if, 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 uh, if healthcare systems aren't in a position to do that, then they probably want to look at who are they partnering with? Who are their vendors? Who are they partnering with? And also interpreters. I, I've, I've done a couple of, of healthcare interpreter education seminars um, through OHCIA actually. And I have said to interpreters, listen, if you're not prepared to walk into a hospital and look like a hospital employee, maybe healthcare isn't the right area for you. Yeah. You yeah, know, it, and that's okay. There's no, there's no shame in that. There, mm -hmm. there, there's, there is enough work around, you know, to go around for everyone. But if you, as an interpreter, think that you can walk into a hospital wearing leggings and a hoodie and flip-flops as an interpreter, yeah, no. you're, you're not going to get the respect that you want mm -hmm. from the healthcare team. Yeah. The healthcare team isn't going to embrace you as a part of their mm -hmm. team because you don't look like a part of their team. Right. And, that, and that's like, the, just what we're saying. It's got to, it's got to come from, you know, from both sides. You, if you're one of that's you, exactly you, right. Look that and view as part of the team, you have to, to show up and, Look the part. Accordingly, have the right qualification and certification. Yep, yep, yep. And if you walk in and and you you and, and, and similarly, as a healthcare system, if I want mm -hmm. the quality of interpreters, if I want interpreters to show up looking like uh, they are a part of the healthcare team, and I want them, and I have to ensure that they're qualified and certified, and that they are compliant with the background checks. Not only do I have to hold the vendor responsible, but I have to make sure that interpreters are compensated accordingly. Mm -hmm. I can't expect an interpreter to come into a hospital and have all of the education and background that I require as a healthcare system and pay them minimum wage either. So it is, it's a give and take. It's a yep. two way street yep. and I'm going to give a little and the interpreters are going to give a little and I'm going to give a little bit more and the interpreters are going to give a little bit more. And then eventually um, I think what happens is, is, Health, multiple healthcare systems around the state start to look at, hey, these are these are great interpreters. You know, we we have some great options here, and we don't have to just accept, you know, anybody walking off the street, you know, coming off of the street who happens to speak the language. Right. We don't have to accept that. We can we can expect more, and expect better for our patients, which we should. Mm -hmm. But we can also expect more and expect better for our providers. You yeah. know, providers, it's important, it's just as important, not maybe not just, right? We, the patient experience is number one, 
Right. But if a provider, if a provider or a healthcare team does not have a good experience with an interpreter or an interpreter service, they are not likely to go back. Yeah. And that's, and then they're likely about, to, it's about raising, raising the bar across, across the board. Yep. Yep. They're likely to cut corners if they have a negative yeah. experience. They're likely to cut corners the next time around. You're you're so you're so 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 true. If, and it's similarly with with another type of um, interpretation. So if we're talking about even if it's via video or if it's over the phone, if yes. they had to wait wait five minutes for the interpreter to connect, they're not going to be providers are going to be super excited about yep. calling or dialing up again for the next interpreter. That's absolutely correct. They have They'll to wait too long video they'll shove the device into the corner and they won't give it a second thought it doesn't matter that it could have been a fluke you know maybe it connects just fine or whatever the case may be could have been a one-time thing but they they the trust is gone right the trust is gone mm -hmm. um when when we have with, when there's situations with there's if there's long hold times with telephonic interpreters or if you have in-person interpreters who are late or no show mm -hmm. or whatever the case may be it this this distrust continues to just yeah. sort of erode and evolve and 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 kind of click uh, chip away mm -hmm. at the confidence that healthcare teams and medical teams have of interpreter services. So we want to we want to uh, counter that yeah. by ensuring that the vendors that we're partnering with are partnering with the best interpreters that we can get. Yeah, no, I love that. And so something just kind of lit lit a lit a, a spark when you said the word trust. Because trust is it's such an important component in, in healthcare, right? Um, the mm -hmm. providers have to trust their team that they're working with. The, the interpreter has to trust the, 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 the healthcare organization that they're representing and the, the language service provider they're representing. And then the, the patient has to be able to trust that if there's an interpreter there, they have to be able to trust that, that the, whatever they're saying is going to be conveyed by a trained professional. And yep. so you know, ultimately it comes down to, to trust on all, all sides mm -hmm. in order for, for, for it to advance. And when we, and when we do that, I think that's what, that's what's so beautiful about when we can truly see health equity happen is when we are, we have all raised, raised those standards of excellence and we've been able to, to trust one another that we're, that we're going to, we're going to carry our part. Um, and then that's really when we see that, that patient experience increase. That's when we see the health outcomes improve uh, when, when we're able to, able to do that. Yes, exactly. That's exactly right. Yeah. But it comes, yeah, really, it really does come down to, um, to trust as you're looking at the industry from your perspective and keeping in mind the, the new normal that we're, we're in now, what do you feel like right now our industry language services is is lacking or really could benefit from having oh boy um good question <laughs> yeah i mean it i think what is what is very clear to me is uh you know providence we talk a lot about serving populations uh, and serving the poor and the vulnerable and a lot of times w one of the things that we talk about here is is that some of the most vulnerable patients that we have are patients can't communicate with their teams, with their medical teams, with their healthcare teams, whether it be coming into an emergency room or um, having a, a, a surgical uh, surgical um, appointment and, and then staying, you know, having an inpatient uh, a hospital stay afterward, aftercare type. Mm -hmm. um, and so there, there are a lot of, there are a lot of opportunities for communication to go awry. And what I, I know, um, we have struggled in the state of Oregon um, specifically, and I, and I know that in the United States, uh, there is a shortage of certified American Sign Language interpreters. There's an even greater shortage, there's a, a, an, an, an even greater uh, need for medical, medically qualified uh, American Sign Language interpreters. In the state of Oregon, there is a shortage mm -hmm. of spoken language interpreters, and there is an uh, even more so when it comes to interpreters who specialize in, in medical terminology and, and are um, uh, specialize in uh, acute and ambulatory care type mm -hmm. visits. And that doesn't seem to be, and I don't know why, but that 
doesn't seem to be getting any better. We, I, it doesn't feel to me like um, the interpreting medical interpreter population, medical interpreting community is keeping up with the demand. Like, there just aren't enough interpreters to go around. Mm-hmm. Um, I also see, uh, especially in Oregon and in the state of Washington, um, our populations are rapidly uh, diversifying. It's, it's not yeah. just about being able to provide Spanish interpreters anymore. Um, yeah. You know, we struggle with, we struggle sometimes with um, our Chukis speaking populations. We struggle uh, finding interpreters for our Rohingya speaking patient yeah. populations. There are, we have some incredible diversity here in Oregon, believe it or not. Yeah, uh, you so. know, despite our despite our history, we do have some incredible diversity here, and these individuals still need. They still require healthcare. They still require medical attention, and we still have an obligation to communicate with them. So, how do we do that if we can't get a Chukis medical interpreter? Yeah. <laughs> if we can't get a Rohingya speaking mm-hmm. medical interpreter, uh, Seattle is especially uh, incredibly diverse and they struggle with certain languages. Bambara is another one. Um, So what I see is uh, as a challenge is there are not enough in-person interpreters in the state of Oregon, at least there are not enough interpreters to go around. The demand is quite high. Uh, Mm -hmm. Mandarin, Cantonese, Korean, uh, there just aren't enough interpreters to go around. So, that's one, that's one hurdle. That's one challenge. And when, when we talk specifically about COVID, uh, the, to add to that shortage, if you will, now we have interpreters who are, some of them might be scared. Yeah. You know, I have had, I can't tell you how many times I, whether it be, whether it be spoken language interpreters or American sign language interpreters, you know, people aren't volunteering to walk into, you know, if they're not, uh, uh, you know, nurses and doctors and providers and clinicians, people are afraid to go to hospitals and clinics. They're afraid what they don't know uh, what could possibly happen. How did, how can they protect themselves? And so we've seen a lot of in-person interpreters opt not to accept in-person assignments. We've seen a shift with COVID Uh, we've seen a shift to um, accessing the the, the uh, technological side of interpreter services. So a lot of telephonic, a lot of video Mm -hmm. interpreters being used. That's fine, right? In theory, Mm -hmm. that's not a problem. But because we know this isn't just happening in Oregon, this is happening across the United States, all healthcare systems are really leaning heavily on the telephonic and the video interpreter services. And so what that's right. doing is it's taxing those systems. It's, it's, uh, we have longer hold times for tele- to connect to a telephonic interpreter. We have longer hold time to connect to a, a video interpreter because Providence isn't the only healthcare system leaning on the technology. Oregon isn't the only state leaning on this technology. So we see our providers uh, of those services we see their resources also being taxed and um, we see vendors kind of struggling to um, increase their workforces to be able to adequately serve the demand, you know, to, 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 to adequately and in a timely fashion. And from a, from a quality perspective, from, from your perspective and the hospital perspective, how does that change the level of quality of care that, that the patients are receiving when it when it changes from from in person to as you as you mentioned obviously a lot of hospitals are shifting more to to remote services you know video over the phone um, scheduled video interpretation etc how 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 does that Im- impact the uh, level of care well so it can it can impact the level of care in a couple of different ways number one um, if you have a if you have a healthcare team that can't wait 10, 11, 12 minutes to connect to the technology, they might, they may attempt to communicate with the patient without an interpreter present. They may attempt to cut those, one of those corners that we talked about earlier. They may, uh, they may say, ah, I couldn't connect to a, 
a Spanish interpreter, it took six, seven, eight minutes. And so I just, you know, they were there with their husband. And so we let the mm -hmm. husband interpret. Um, so that has the potential to impact patient care. It also impacts, um, it can impact the patient experience because if they aren't expecting their family member to interpret for them, how, how do they, can they feel confident that their family member understands what is, what exactly their, their healthcare team, that their medical team is, is conveying? Um, so do they walk away with the same level of confidence from their, uh, from their encounter, from their visit? Do they, do they walk away with the same level of confidence that they would if an interpreter had been there? Um, yeah, again, just coming, coming down to, to trust again. If the provider can't trust that connection time or the yep. patient didn't have that the, the experience, they're not going to trust coming back again next time. Or Yeah, you know. and, and you know, one of the things that we've been talking a, a little bit about recently, in, in the recent mm -hmm. weeks since COVID, is um, there is also nothing more awkward than having the video interpreter in the room. You have a non-English speaking patient, you have a, an English speaking provider, and you're waiting, waiting, waiting for that connection to happen. In the meantime, the communication between the provider and the patient is little to none because they don't right. communicate with one another if they're not speaking the same language. And so that can be a, that can be an awkward silence, yes. uh, depending yeah. on how long. And I have had some people say, oh, we waited 10 minutes. Well, sometimes 60 seconds feels like 10 minutes when you yeah. can't communicate with the person sitting in front of you. Um, so imagine mm -hmm. if there is a 10 minute wait, that just, yeah. and the experience for the providers, you know, providers, they start to feel frustrated. Of course. Um, it could change their, it could change their demeanor and their attitude. Um, maybe they don't, uh, if it's a, if it's a well visit, maybe they, maybe they don't go into as much detail as they would have otherwise, if they'd had the full 45 minute block of time. Now they've had right. 10 minutes cut out of their visit. Big, so they big can't, they can't spend the kind of time with a patient that they would have with a, with an English speaking patient that didn't require an interpreter. And maybe the patient has more questions that they just don't have time to get to. There's any number of ways that this, that leaning on technology like this and this, this um, pressure that COVID has put on our, the stress that COVID has yeah. put on our teams and not only our medical teams, but our interpreting teams um, it, it has the it has the potential to impact patient care in many many different ways. So, especially in emergent situations. Yeah. I mean, we talk about clinic appointments, but coming into an emergency department or immediate an immediate care clinic, uh, you know, that immediate access to interpreters that's that is crucial in 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 making sure that um, that communication takes place in a timely manner, depending on what that medical circumstances. Yeah. And being yeah. able to rely on technology. Nothing. There's nothing worse than when a a deaf patient is using video and trying to communicate with their provider and the, the, the signal goes out. And now all of a sudden you're like, you're, you're stuck, you know, yeah. you're stuck. And that, and that can happen. The technology obviously can technology can fail their connection. Yep, technology can fail. Yeah. Um, it's a real, real, real challenges there. And um, well, Jennifer, I know we're, we're getting, we're getting close, close here on, on time. I just want to thank you for, for your, your passion and just being, I, I'd call it a crusade that, that you're on just to help overall raise the standards for, for our industry, for our healthcare uh, interpretation and translation industry. And um, I thank you for, for just how, how important it is for you that we're ultimately in all areas raising, raising the, the standard of excellence and, um, and setting, setting the bar, ultimately building trust with providers, building trust with, with patients, with interpreters and, and a, which it does allow them to be and feel and be viewed as part of the part of the medical team. And so I just yeah. want to say thank you for, for your hard work and dedication that you're putting in every day for, for our industry. Um, and I think we covered a lot of, a lot of great, great questions here that uh, will hopefully be of, of value to the, to the community, the medical community. Um, so, so thank you for, for being a part of it. Yeah, my pleasure. It's I, I, um, I have really learned a lot in healthcare, and I've, I've come to, like you said, I'm, I'm super passionate about making sure that our patients um, get the best quality of care that they deserve, and not just our patients, but mm -hmm. any patients, uh, patients at Providence, patients at Kaiser, patients in Oregon, patients in 
Maryland, you know, yeah. I, I, I think often about what, what families must go through um, when they are seeking medical treatment for, for loved ones and just feeling so lost that they, because they can't communicate with their medical teams. And so to me, I just feel like communication is at the core of making sure that, that we as a healthcare system, as an industry are taking care of the people that we've committed ourselves to. We've committed yes. to, yes. Uh, as I say, sometimes, you know, saving lives and delivering babies. We've, we've committed ourselves to taking care of people. Um, and, and so we can't do that if we can't communicate with them. So I, mm. I am very passionate about that. And I'm, I'm passionate about making sure that interpreters, um, interpreters and interpreter services are not only provided, but that they're provided in a quality and meaningful way. Right. It's definitely a partnership between, yeah. you know, healthcare and interpreter slash interpreter mm -hmm. services vendors, you know, yeah. it's a, it's a partnership. Um, and it's, it's a little bit of give and take. Sometimes I, I feel like, well, if, if we raise the bar, will they rise to the occasion or do we accept them to, do we expect the interpreters to rise to the occasion first and we'll meet them there, you know? Mm -hmm. And so um, there's a, there's a, there's a balance. And, and I think that we talk a lot about that. And I think that that's really important. Um, and hopefully interpreters hear it and hopefully yeah. providers hear it and equally understand the importance of their role in, uh, in that, in that relationship and mm -hmm. um, understand that, that, that at, at the end of the day, uh, whether it be the provider or the interpreter, the goal is the same. Right. And that's to, that's to ensure that the patient understands what's happening. And the goal is the, is, is exactly. the well-being of the patient. Yeah. And I mean, I remember, you know, back in you know, 2016, when we first started our, our, our partnership together and, you know, right out of the gates, it was like, hey, Jennifer's, Jennifer's raising the bar. Like she's raising the bar. And, and, and it was obvious it, st it stood out because it was a higher bar than a lot of other um, hospitals, quite frankly. So and that, I think it continues to be from what I hear. I, yeah, it, I think it, it kind it, of continues yeah. to be. But it's like um, Providence at the bar high. And then a lot of other hospitals, we you know have been kind of slowly, slowly, but, mm -hmm. they're, but they're, but they're raising that bar yes. each year as well. So it was like Providence set it high. It was like, this is going to be uncomfortable and this is going to yeah. be not easy for everyone. But, um, but it's where we, where we ultimately have to go. Cause if you're, if we're, when you're talking about standards, they yeah. either have to be met every time or the moment that we're like, well, yeah, sometimes when, when possible, you know, try to, all those things, it just, it, well, well I do understand. And is that, that's why it's, it's such a unique industry that we're in with language services because mm -hmm. there's interpreters, there's languages like Spanish or, mm -hmm. you know, or, or ASL or Russian or Vietnamese or Cantonese where, yes, it's going to be, there's going to be much more volume. And then there's mm -hmm. going to be languages like mom or Rohingya, like you mentioned, or, or Chukis, yeah. where there's not going to be as much request. And so can you hold both of those interpreters to the same standard? And I think exactly. that's, a, that's a real, real challenge. But yeah. ultimately, if, if we start to play that game of, well, okay, you're, you're language number 12, so you don't have to have these, but language seven and eight and below, those do um, language... 42. Yeah, we can just have anybody for that language, you know, then ultimately, mm -hmm. again, you have to look at all patients the same, right? We want the patient yep. experience, health outcomes, um, the, the, the overall care to be the same. So exactly change for interpreters e either. And so I think that's what, what you've done where it's like, okay, it's not, it is more of a challenge finding that interpreter for XYZ language, but we have to set, set the standard somewhere. Yeah, exactly. You have to start somewhere. And I think, like you said, you would not, you're definitely not the first person that has come to me and said, this is really uncomfortable. <laughs> you know, uh, and, and, and I guess, you know, for me, I just, I don't know any different, but it's not to say that I also don't understand. I understand. I understand mm -hmm. that sometimes, you know, what did they say is the um, the path of least resistance or yeah. something to that effect, you know, it's, mm -hmm. do we, do we go to that warm body syndrome? That's what I, we always called it is, you know, do you just have a warm body of someone who, when we were doing cruises, it was, do you have somebody who has a warm body that you can put on a cruise ship that can wave their hands in the air and have some semblance of American sign language? No, that's not what it's about. 
And, uh, and so I think that it's easy, um, easier to be able to say, well, because, because language access programs often aren't looked at from a regulatory standpoint, even though the regulations exist, yeah. where's the enforcement? And because the enforcement sometimes doesn't exist, it's easy to say that, well, we're not going to require background checks on vendor, on interpreters, or we're not going to require that the interpreters have X, Y, Z in the certification and qualification columns. And, and, and you are sure to get more interpreters through the door that way. Yeah. But, oh, yeah. but then, the, but then you ask yourself, do they belong there though? Do they belong there? And, and what what's does that it going ultimately to do for the, for the industry, for the profession? And of course the, that, that patient who's receiving that as well, like exactly. you said earlier, it's, it's good enough. Okay. I think, you know, talk one time mentioned a good metaphor for that too. It's, you touched on it earlier. It's like if someone needed a wheelchair and you had an old wheelchair that was like you know, rusty and clunky, didn't, the wheels didn't really turn. Yeah. Would you go into your, in your hospital and grab that wheelchair and be like, here, here, here you go. I think this, this, you can sit, sit on this, right? Does this work? It's like, no, no, you're going to get a wheelchair that's going to be, you know, polished and yep. it's going to look great and it's going to work fine. So why would it, you know, why would an interpreter be any different? Um, well, that's exactly true. And, and, you know, if good enough isn't, and the thing is, is the cost of something going wrong is so much greater uh, on so many levels, not just, not just the financial cost, but the impact that that has on families and caregivers alike. If something yeah. goes wrong, the impact that that has on people, um, I've mm -hmm. seen interpreters, I've seen interpreters put themselves in some of the most trying situations and come away, um, you know, maybe wanting some spiritual care attention, needing some spiritual care guidance. Yeah. Um, they, they are there in the trenches right alongside these yeah. clinicians and these providers. And, and, um, and I think that um, the cost of good enough is so great on so many levels um, that uh, we, we owe it to patients Mm -hmm. And we owe it, we owe it to clinicians and we owe it to interpreters to hold them to a higher standard. Right. Could you imagine bringing in an interpreter um, that wasn't qualified for the work and having and putting them through an experience, you know, that they come in and I, 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 I mean, I, we've had a, we had a patient who had their, their, they had to have their trach replaced mm. and it, it didn't go smoothly. And when it doesn't go, when that process, when that procedure does not go smoothly, it is, it's not a great, yeah. it's not great to witness, right? And as an interpreter, that can be very traumatizing. So can you imagine bringing interpreters into, mm. into situations and into an environment that they aren't prepared for and what that yeah. can do to a human being that, that doesn't, isn't, yeah. isn't prepared and, and equipped to handle those types of things. So yeah. I think that, you know, Holding interpreters, holding clinicians, holding healthcare systems, um, holding vendors, everyone to this higher standard, and, and and we'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah. No, we 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 definitely will. Like you said, I mean, interpreters are they're they're in the front lines. They're experiencing extreme extreme situations from you know from cancer diagnoses to you know like you said, if a surgery goes wrong to to mm -hmm. death and um, having to be able to go from bounce from that appointment right to right into the, the next appointment an hour, an hour later. Um, yeah. Yeah. Be, be fully ready, ready in, in, to engage. And so it's, it's a, it takes a, a trained, trained professional and someone who's, who's going to, going to be able to do that. And like you said, if, if you don't have the proper training, then mm -hmm. it can, I mean, we all know of the, the, the many, um, lawsuits you know the the, the most oh yeah this one Will, willie ramirez you know out of florida 71 million dollar lawsuit and you know it's just like like you said the cost of not raising the bar for on all sides is way way too high yeah yeah we want to thank everyone else for for tuning in and joining this uh spirited conversation here with jennifer alvarez from from providence and feel free to go ahead if you like this conversation and want to hear more hit like and subscribe to to the channel so you can get more more content and knowledge and information just like we shared today and feel free to uh to share this with uh, your your network and community as well jennifer thank you so much for for your time today my pleasure thanks david